Okay, I think we're officially past 07, which is our time, so <laughs> let's get started. So it's great. We have uh, again, you know, two speakers today for Vaco Plus. First gonna be Mo for friends, and we know from the Shuri group. It's gonna tell us about momentum energy and spin the short calorie spectra of control systems. Okay, so Hi, my name is Hyun Mo Yu. I'm a graduate student in Ray Ashuri School at MIT. What I'm going to talk about today is the technique, the tunneling technique that our group has been specialized for many years. And one of the many exciting things about this technique is that you can do tunneling into any kind of insulators, including quantum Mohr effect systems. And we gently extended this technique to momentum space so that we can get these beautiful RPS like pictures of and the dispersion of two-dimensional semiconductor. And on the top of this, you can even do spin resolved tunneling so that you can study spin-dependent phenomena in quantum core effect system. So first, I'm going to introduce the basic concept of our technique, which is first form of tunneling spectroscopy. So here, we use short electrical pulses to drive the charge into the system. In this way, we can achieve extraordinary energy resolution the sensitivity of the resonance arising from the tunneling event. And extending this technique to momentum space, you can do full momentum and energy visual spectroscopy, which works at high magnetic field in strong quantum Mohr region. And again, if on the top of this, you can even do spin visual tunneling. Here, we can not only measure the ground state spin polarization, but we can also look at the spin structure in the excited states at high energy, which has never been explored before in quantum Mohr quantum effect system. So first, I'm going to briefly review previous technique. So tunneling in general, you might think it is not very difficult to do. For example, you can imagine making samples like this 2D to 3D tunnel junction, and then make a separate context. Then you can apply a voltage bias between these two layer, and then measure electrical current. However, it turns out that there are many issues with this simple approach. For example, when the sample is resistive, then you have voltage drops in the, along the plane of the 2D system. This means that you have different voltage drops at the different places where electrons are tunneled in. So your spectrum is blurred by these irregular voltage drops in the 2D system. This means that in the strong incompressible quantum state, it is impossible to measure the, perform the measurement. The reason is that you, we have the fully insulating work in the sample. And in addition to this inflamed conductivity issue, when you try to look at the high energy, then you have giant heating. The reason is that you have continuous voltage and continuous current that goes, goes into the, the, to the system. Finally, when you apply a ton voltage for tunneling, then you are getting the system at the same time. This means that it is difficult to precisely maintain the, two, the density of the 2D system, particularly at high energy. So however, but it turns out that you can circumvent all these issues using our technique, which is pulsed tunneling spectroscopy. So here, the main idea is that you place the 2D system in the parallel plates of the capacitor, but too closer to the one other plate to allow the electron tunneling. So in order to perform the measurement, we first apply a pulsed voltage across the entire structure to drive the charge into this 2D system. When you drive the charge into this 2D system, then there is, in fact, image charge that appear on the opposite plate. So this means that by detecting this image charge in time domain, you can extract the tunneling current that goes into this 2D system. So this is the simplified schematic of our sample. So our sample consists of thin layer of the gallium arsenide, and there is thick and thinner insulating aluminum gallium arsenide barrier. So electron can only tunnel through this thinner layer. So to, in order to perform the measurement, we first apply a pulsed voltage across the entire structure then measure the image charge in time domain. And along with this AC pulsed voltage, we can also apply DC voltage to tune the density of the, this 2D system. So when you apply a pulse, a single pulse in the actual experiment, you get lots of noises. The reason is that there are only a few electrons that are involved in the tunneling process. But if you keep averaging the data, then you get this RC-like charging shape. But what really matters in the actual experiment is the initial rise of the charge that goes into the 2D system. So we fit the initial flow, which gives the one point in the IV characteristic. Then by changing the amplitude of the pulsed voltage and performing the same procedure, we can construct this complete IV characteristic of the system. Then by taking derivative, we can get this DIDB curve, 
which reflects the density of the, density of the states in the system. Here, so here I'm plotting the same DIDB curve on the left side. On the right side, there is the bright and dark region, which corresponds to the large and small density of the states. And as I said earlier, you can tune the density of the system by changing the DC gate voltage. So here, I'm changing the DC voltage and measuring the same DIDB curve. In, and in this way, you can construct the full tunneling spectrum of the system. So this spectrum is measured under perpendicular magnetic field for Tesla. And here, the vertical axis is, is the energy reference to the Fermi energy. And the x-axis is the DC voltage that tunes the density of the system. So what's happening in this picture is that you are looking at the lowest Landau level. For example, uh, so for example, this part is filling factor zero, and this part is filling factor one, and this part is filling factor two. So at filling factor, okay, thank you. <laughs> so at filling factor one, you can see large exchange splitting at the Fermi energy. And you can also identify the next Landau level at high energy. A similar magnetic field, you can see more numbers of more numbers of discretized Landau levels in the spectrum. But if you, in addition, if you look at carefully, there is exchange splitting at the Fermi energy at each odd integer filling factor. A high, high magnetic field, we discovered many, many new features, which I'm going to discuss in the later part of the talk. So let me briefly, briefly summarize the key features of the pulse tunneling technique. First, the heating is minimized because of the short duty cycle of the measurement. And second, you can precisely determine the electron density and tunneling voltage. Energy resolution, in the end, is only limited by electron temperature in the sample. <laughs> Finally, the most remarkable things about this technique is that it works for insulating system. The reason is that there is no implaying current in this vertical structure. And this is very important because we have insulating bulk in the sample in the incompressible <laughs> quantum states. In the past experiment, we used this, te this technique and discovered lots of new features in the quantum effect system. But what I'm going to show you now is our most recent work, which is momentum reserved tunneling. So in order to reserve the momentum in tunneling, we added one more layer of the two-dimensional electronic system in this parallel place of the capacitor. So the electron is tunneling from one layer to another layer. So in the previous case, in the 3D to 2D tunneling, we, we can only study the energy dependence of the density of the states. But on the other hand, in the case of the 2D, 2D tunneling, there is this strict momentum conservation for tunneling process. This means that if we can somehow control the momentum of the tunneling electron, then we can measure the momentum reserved tunneling spectrum of the system. So in order to perform the measurement in our 2D, 2D structure, the first thing we did was to keep the density of the one layer extremely small that we electrons are occupied in this point like Fermi surface in that layer. And we call this layer probe layer. In the meantime, we can tune the density of the other layer, which we call it tiger layer. So electron is tunneling from probe layer to the tiger layer. But here, the main idea is that we use this point-like Fermi surface as a probe to study the empty states in the tiger layer. And the next thing we did was to tune the, the control the momentum of the electron tunneling from probe layer to the tiger layer. In order to do that, we applied a magnetic field that is or that is parallel to the plane of the 2D system so that the trajectory of the electron is refracted by Lorentz force. This means that we can control, we can move electron initially <coughs> occupied in this point-like Fermi, Fermi surface in probe layer to anywhere in the momentum space in tiger layer. So by controlling this momentum of the tunnel electron, we can construct this full energy and momentum reserved electronic structure of the two-dimensional electronic system in gallium arsenide quantum What's the color of this? Just to know how, what is actually measured? So intensity of the... The current and voltage. Intensity. So there is actually unit. Is, I didn't put the unit. There is, we measure the, basically what we measure is the... Basically this slope, right? Mm -hmm. This slope, sh in principle, should have some unit. Yes. But we didn't... But it's colored, right? Right, it's colored, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. So we have this parabolic dispersion of the, this, 
two pair of the dispersion, then the lower, lower band, lower one corresponds to the lowest subband of the contour. The next one corresponds to the dispersion of the next excited subband. I'm sorry, just to make sure. You think you call it the nature of the spectral function, the maximum coverage of the, of the most plus or minus subband is not to be the tonal structure, right? So tonal what is. What do you mean by spectral function? You mean the human band structure or? So in principle, can I discuss it later? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <coughs> so here uh, we have three tonal spectra at different densities. Uh, as you first expected, as you increase the density, the parabolic dispersion is shifted down below the Fermi energy so that we have more numbers of the occupied states below the Fermi energy. But what's more interesting in this spectra is that we discovered some kink of the dispersion and large broadening at some places in tonal spectrum. And what's happening at those places was that you develop large inelastic scattering channel because of the electron of the interaction. For example, if you look at this spectrum at the center, you can see this, you can see this slight kink of the dispersion at the phonon energy above the bottom of this bottom of above the Fermi energy, and another slight kink above the Fermi phonon energy above the bottom of the subband. <laughs> and it turns out so that this means that. What you are seeing in our tonal spectrum is the spectral function, just like the RPS experiment. And spectral function in weakly interacting system is given by this Lorentzian function. Here, the important parameter is the self-energy. And one of the intuitive way to think about this self-energy is the refractive index that describes the light propagation in medium. So the idea is that light gets refracted between two different medium. The reason is that light slows down in denser medium. In a similar manner, Electron in interacting system, the spectral function deviates from the free particle band dispersion in a way that group velocity slows down, you know, group velocity at the Fermi energy is slowed down. So it's similar to this refractive index, self energy consists of real and imaginary parts, where real parts describe the deviation from the free particle band dispersion, and imaginary parts, which corresponds to the broadening in Lorentzian function, describes the, the scattering or lifetime of the coach particle. So, for example, this is the spectral function. This picture is the spectral function of the typical BCS superconductor where you expect large electron of the interactions. So, if you look at this picture, the spectral function deviates from this red dashed line, which is the bare band dispersion, in a way that the group velocity at the Fermi wave vector is slowed down. In addition, you can also see the kink of the spectral function and large broadening, which develops at the phonon energy above the superconducting gap. So in our tonal spectrum, we also identified this effect of the electron of the phonon interaction. For example, if you look at our tonal spectrum, there's the kink and the kink of the dispersion and large broadening, which develops at the optic phonon energy above the bottom of the, the subband. So this explain this so this demonstrated that our we, we so we the bottom line is that we identified this effect of the electron of the phonon interactions in our zero field zero field spectrum, zero field tonal spectrum. Then the question is, what happens to this? Oh no, so there is, actually I didn't describe it. There is another electron of the phonon interaction at the phonon energy above the deformed energy. That's why the bottom of the subband is actually flattened by the, yeah. So this is the another, in, in some sense, this is the kink of the dispersion at the, at the bottom of this band. So the question is, what happens to this tonal spectrum when you apply perpendicular magnetic field, which catches the kinetic energy, the kinetic energy, and we apply the perpendicular magnetic field. And the first thing we observed was the evolution of the discretized Landau levels from this simple parabolic dispersion. But what's more interesting in this spectra is that we observed sudden splitting of the Landau level. Which, uh, which is located at phonon energy above the deformed energy. And it turns out that this splitting can be explained by Rabi splitting in two-level system. So let me briefly explain it in simple picture. So in our system, there are two levels where electron can tunnel in. For example, there is the Landau level in the lowest, lowest subband, and there is another Landau level in the next excited subband. And if this subband energy spacing is accidentally corresponds the the electron, the optic phonon energy, then these two levels can interfere with each other. 
But then this interference gives the splitting of the energy level. In other words, this splitting can be also understood as the hybridization between electron state and optical, optical phonon state in the presence of their strong coupling. So according to this picture, the splitting can be splitting, the strength of the splitting also depends on the number of the available states in the lower level. This means that if we increase the magnetic field, then we increase the degeneracy of the level, so we should expect larger splitting. So in fact, as we ramp up the magnetic field, we observe larger, larger splitting, which explains the quadratic growth of the splitting as, as a function of the perpendicular magnetic field. Then the, what happens to the splitting when we increase the electron density is that the splitting goes away. The reason is that as we increase the, the density, the, we feel the lower level, lower Landau, lowest Landau level, so the number of the available states are reduced. So as you can see from these two tunnel spectra, we increase the density from right to left side. And as we increase the density, the, the splitting goes away, which is the consistent with this, this, this previous picture. So the bottom line is that we identified this effect of the electron optophono interaction from equally interacting limit where we observe kink and the broadening of the dispersion to strongly interacting limit where we observe sudden splitting of the energy level at high field spectrum. Now I'm going to move on to the last part of the talk, which is the spin reserve tunneling. And in the past experiment, people used conventional techniques such as NMR to measure the ground state spin polarization of the system. Here, using this spin reserve, using this spin reserve tunneling, we can not only measure the ground state spin polarization, but we can look at the spin structure in the excited states at high energy. So before explaining how, how our technique works, let me briefly review the relationship between the spin and the tunneling spectrum of the quantum effect system. So quantum effect system in general can be described by these simple discrete Landau levels. And here, depending on the filling fraction of the Landau level, the system can have different spin configuration. For example, at even integer filling factor, the energy level is occupied by equal numbers of up spin and down spin electrons. On the other hand, at the odd integer filling factor, there is, because of the strong exchange interactions between electrons, the electrons in the system favor to align the spin. So for example, at filling factor one, there is large splitting at the Fermi energy, and there's another spin splitting at high energy in the next Landau level. So in this case, the spin is fully spin polarized. The system is fully spin polarized in the limit of zero G1 energy. So our experimental approach to resolve the spin in tunneling is very simple. Let's imagine two parallel layers of the two-dimensional electronic system where one layer is fixed at filling factor one so that this system is fully spin polarized. In the meantime, we can tune the density of the system under study. So here the idea is that we use this ferromagnet, this ferromagnet as a probe to study the spin polarization of the occupied states in the system under study. So in this case, because there is no empty states left for off-spin electron, only downspin electron can tunnel into this ferromagnet. So given the fact that only downspin down electrons are involved in the tunneling process, when you integrate the tunneling current, then you get a quantity that is proportional to the downspin electron density in the system under study. So therefore, we can extract the ground state spin polarization of the system by measuring the integrated tunneling current. So here are two tunneling spectra. One on the right side is the spin degenerates 3D to 2D, and one on the left side is the spin reserved 2D to 2D tunneling spectrum. First, the overall shape of the two spectra look quite similar except for the fact that spin reserved 2D to the tunneling spectrum is shipped down. The reason is that there is the additional cost of energy to inject single particle into this ferromagnet. The main difference between these two spectra is that tunneling current is suppressed at filling factor one at low density. And as I said earlier, only downspin electrons are involved in the tunneling process. So if the system under study is upspin polarized, then tunneling current must be suppressed. So the suppression of the tunneling current indicates the system under study is up, up, up spin polarized. So from this spin reserved to the, to the sub, to spin reserved to the, to the sub spectrum, we can extract the ground state spin polarization. And as I said earlier, spin polarization is determined from the integrated tunneling current. For example, at filling factor one, I have almost zero current, which gives the larger value of the spin polarization. This near filling, filling factor one, we observe rapid depolarization of the electronic spin, which is consistent with the formation of the skarmion. And besides the feature near nuclear one, we also identified the first spin polarization and depolarization of the, of the, of the spin at fractional quantum state. 
So for comparison, I'd like to just use this one of the most well-known experiment performed by the Lars Timon and Coach Bracky at Japan. And even though this is very beautiful data, they have some technical issues so that they cannot really measure the spin polarization at certain range of the film factors because they, their experiment is relies on the hyperfine interactions in the system. But on the, on the other hand, in our, in our technique, we, we don't really have limitations in terms of the range of the film factors. So, so we hope that we can extend this technique to understand, so measure more, more numbers of spin polarization of the other fractional quantum state. So let me move on to the, the spin structure at high energy. But before demonstrating the, our data, I'd like to briefly explain why this is interesting. So the reason is that we observe striking features in the excited states of the quantum effect system. And this is the 3D to 2D tunnel spectrum. And here, if you look at the region, this indicates by this blue arrow, there's this some kind of splitting in the tunneling peaks. And this feature becomes more pronounced at higher magnetic field. And you can see more features at different places in this high field spectrum. And it was very unusual because this feature cannot be explained by simple single particle model. However, it turns out that this feature can be explained by spin-dependent two-body interactions in the quantum effect system. So there are two models, two same models explaining these features. So let me start with the first one. The first one is the lattice model. And here we assumed a lat hex lattice of the uh, hexagonal, fictitious hexagonal lattice, and then determined cost of energy to inject electron that is either empty or occupied by opposite spin electron. And then simulation predicts that there are two distinct tunneling peaks where the high energy peak corresponds to the electron tunneling into site that is occupied by opposite spin electron and lower energy peak corresponds to this electron tunneling into the empty site. And this lattice model is further elaborated by Arlen McDonald and he proposed that this feature can be explained by the two-body high-density two potentials. But I'm not going to talk about the details of the model, but the bottom line is that these two models predict the spin structure in the excited state of the tunneling spectrum, which arise from the spin-dependent two-body Coulomb interactions in the system. So our experimental approach is, again, very simple. As I said earlier, in our case, only downspin electrons are involved in the tunneling process. So in this case, we can study the spin-down component of the tunneling spectrum. In order to probe the spin-up component, we applied larger, much larger tunneling voltage so that electron tunnel into the next spin-up lambda level. In this case, we can probe the spin-up component of the tunneling spectrum. So here are three tunneling spectra. One on the right side is the spin degenerate 3D to 2D, and one on the center is the spin-up, and one on the left side is spin-down tunneling. So as we, first, as we expected, the spin-down tunneling is suppressed at filling factor one, whereas there is no suppression in spin-up tunneling. And this, again, indicates that the system under study is upspin polarized at filling factor one. The main difference between spin up and spin down is that this, some, this feature, this double peak structure, is only present in spin up tunneling. For example, if you look at the line cut taken near filling factor, factor two, there is the double peak structure in spin, spin up tunneling, whereas there is only single peak in spin down tunneling. So based on this result, we can assign the spin indices to the excited states of the quantum effect system. For example, at filling factor one and at low density, the, the occupied states are up spin polarized. At intermediate filling factor near filling factor two, there are two branches where the lower band corresponds to the spin up state. And we are currently on the way to map out the full spin structure of the excited states of the quantum effect system, particularly at high magnetic field where we observe more features at different places in the spectrum. So we believe that this measurement will provide a unified pictures of the tunneling spectrum in the quantum effect system. So let me conclude my talk. So we developed momentum and energy and even spin resolved tunneling technique. And using this technique, we discovered lots of new features in our quantum effect system, including the effect of the electron optic phonon interactions. And we measured the ground state spin polarization of the system. And we have new capability to look at the spin structure in the excited states of the, of the system. And before ending my talk, I'd like to briefly explain what we are doing in our lab. First of all, we are exploring the fractional quantum states using our technique. And there's the inferior region theory proposed by Brian Skinner and Patrick Reed that there is some relationship between the spin polarization and the Coulomb gap in the tunneling density of states. So, the, so in fact, we have new technique that can simultaneously measure these two properties so that we believe that 
by measuring these two link between these two properties, we, we believe that we can better understand the fractional quantum states. We are also working on the even denominator of fractional quantum states, and there is still un unsettled questions about this, the, the properties of these this unconventional states. So the so our goal is to demonstrate some interesting data to better understand the, this what's going on in this particular fractional quantum state. So I'd like to thank all my people in my in my group. First, particularly, I'd like to thank my advisor Ray Ashuri and Juno Zhang, the postdoc who I, whom I worked with mostly. And we got the sample from Lorraine Pfeiffer, Ken West, and Baldwin at Princeton. And we go. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> so I think I should answer your question, right? About yeah. the spectral point, yeah. So in 2D 2D tunneling, in 2D 2D tunneling, um, strict, strictly speaking, the 2D 2D tunneling measures the convolution of the two spectral function. But here the idea is that if the if the one layer has the point-like Fermi surface, then you can somehow. It's not strict, strictly speaking, it's not correct, but you can assume it as a delta function. Then you convolution between the delta function and the spectral function, and you get spectral function of the system. That's the some like hand wavy way of explaining it. Yeah, yeah. Hope I look at it. Yeah. Oh, it's the, it's the yeah. I can explain. So basically, quantum air has the different sub, the wave function, right? The next wave function penetrates more into the the barrier so that the tunneling makes the term is much stronger for next step time. Yeah. I think it's possible, but experimentally it might be some difficult. Uh, uh, I mean, nobody knows about the charged excitation spectrum of external condensate states, so it can be interesting so in that sense. It's, it's more definitely not, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not the same with the field you have to have the So that, that dark band is the origin of light, which is the equivalent of a whole electron in the PC system and the other electron in the uh, oh. magnetic field is what's happening. So there's a, there's a connection. So you think that's why the gap in the sphere of energy
English sometimes, maybe if it's not very comprehensive. Sorry, I to speak. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so I had the opportunity to follow some of the speakers on, on YouTube and it's great thing. Um, uh, it's great pleasure for me to be here today. So my name is Riyad Yayawi and uh, uh, I am a research fellow uh, at Howard University uh, in the group of uh, Professor Thomas Searles. And uh, today I'm, I'm going to speak about tunable terahertz uh, metamaterials uh, based on phase change and quantum materials. So, and this is the outline of my presentation. I I'm going to uh, give an introduction about metamaterials. Um, so we will see some uh, examples of uh, different, some examples of tunable metamaterials including mechanical stimulate uh, using phase change materials. So we have two different examples. An example using strontium tantanite, a single crystal, and uh, another example uh, based on germanium uh, antimony telluride, GST, which is a chalcogenide glass. Uh, probably uh, uh, one a very fast tunable technique is maybe uh, use uh, an optically controlled uh, material such as uh, silicon, for example. And the last part of my presentation will be dedicated for uh, uh, to quantum materials such as graphene and transition metal dichalcogenides. Uh, and I will conclude with some uh, future perspectives. And probably I uh, will start with um, to describe a little bit our research, um, some of our research activities following this uh, technical approach. So we always start with simulations using software uh, simulators such as HFSS or CST Microwave Studio. Um, we also try to fabricate samples. We have some experimental setups um, such as terahertz time domain spectroscopy uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Uh, we have also some tools that we use uh, for post-processing and uh, analyzing data, uh, data. So we try to close this loop and do everything in-house, but we have also some collaborators with the perspective of achieving high technology materials in, in rapid time. So terahertz, um, is currently has been uh, has become very popular and very well established but for a long time it remained unexplored because the lack of suitable emitters and detectors um, and usually uh, the frequency around one terahertz is is usually uh, referred to uh, as a terahertz gap which divides the spectrum in two different worlds electronics and optics but currently, uh, right now, people are able to get access to this frequency uh, range uh, easily. So metamaterials are usually defined as a common uh, subwave, uh, sorry, uh, as a collection of subwavelength res um, uh, resonators, typ typically organized in a regular lattice, um, designed to interact and couple with light with a perspective of achieving new functions with uh, high performance. So usually when metamaterials are manufactured, they usually have fixed properties, uh, which typically depends on different factors, uh, dielectric environment, uh, geometrical dimensions, but also the orientation of the resonators with respect to the incident uh, light. And what people try to do is to change the static performance into dynamically controlled properties by combining metamaterial concept with active materials. And what also people, people try to do, and I think it becomes very important and uh, a, a very challenging task, is to build some kind of uh, platforms with multiple functions with also the ability to switch between these different uh, functions. And uh, this platform are usually dedicated for plasmonics or optics or both. So different techniques have been, um, 
have been explored and used in literature. Uh, and probably when we speak about tunability, we may have, we can divide the concept in two different, uh, in two different uh, aspects. Uh, we can speak about frequency tunability or change in the frequency of resonance. We can also speak about an amplitude modulation or a change in the resonance strength at the same frequency. So we can find, for example, at microwaves, people um, using localized components such as diodes or uh, capacitors. Okay, capacitors. Um, and this usually uh, will change the equivalent circuit uh, of, of the unit cell when we apply an external uh, voltage. But metamaterials um, can be also geometrically tuned by uh, um, by moving the resonators, for example, with respect to each others, or by stretching or bending the structure, we can have, or we can expect having a, a tunable effect. And uh, this is an example of mechanically uh, tunable metamaterial based on uh, what we call a split ring resonator, which is a typical structure in, in, in metamaterial. And the concept of tunability here is is based on very simple idea, which consists to use materials with different thermal expansion coefficient. In this case, silicon nitride and gold. So actually, uh, when you uh, start heating, the structure will bend, and this will um, slightly change the topology or the profile of the structure, or the shape, latest constant. And in this particular case, uh, people got uh, this change in, in amplitude modulation, uh, in, in uh, the amplitude of the resonance. So usually metamaterials have a composite natures, which mean um, that you have metal inclusions uh, integrated or printed on a dielectric substrate. But this is an example of all dielectric metamaterial, which is based on a single crystal strontium tantanite, uh, which have a dielectric function which, de which depends on, on the temperature, but also on uh, the gate voltage or the static electric field. So we started here with a bulk material that has been uh, uh, treated or processed in different uh, steps by using mechanical polishing, chemical aging, and light, uh, laser micromachining technique. So we got some samples, some kind of birefringent uh, filters with very large uh, aspect ratios, since the surface of, of the samples um, is very, uh, very, very large with respect to the, to the thickness, which is only very, uh, about 20 microns which makes the samples very fragile. So we got here what we call uh, my resonances uh, with a tunability rate of about 15%, about de uh, a point decreasing the temperature. And probably to see what happens inside the structure or inside the bars. So we plot here the map of the electric field at the first resonant mode. And um, so we have some kind of dielectric confinement, which is very similar in some way uh, to uh, potential wells. And uh, physically what happens here, the structure couples to the, uh, the incident light, traps energy, which, is, which will be transformed into displacive eddy current inside the structure, inside the bars. So, Another, um, another type or a group of material um, is phase. In fact, we have, uh, um, so, so we demonstrate this effect only by, uh, in, uh, with temperature, but uh, our, uh, my colleagues uh, from Czech Republic, they, they um, demonstrated the same effect uh, uh, with uh, electrical uh, gate, but the, um, they didn't, 
they were not able to, um, to demonstrate a, a huge uh, rate of tunability. So probably it, maybe. Yes, right, yeah. 5,000 Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tune it. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Uh, you can tune it. Um, w w in which uh, wavelength you mean? Or? Well, you can tune the dialectic function. I don't think that's that. Yeah, frequency dependent. Yeah, yeah, it's frequency. Uh, um, maybe in this frequency range, it's about 300. Okay. Um, it may fluctuate between 500 and 300, maybe, or less, two. 150, but the tunability effect is much more pronounced um, yeah. in temperature. Yeah. Yes. Can you show that the new resonance has these two functions of the mobility around the arrow of the region? So one of the reasons I want to have a material you use as a beauty block of the from your like a new resonance based on the material. The 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 material right. itself is strontium tantalite. Uh, in the beginning, it was about the thickness was about 250 microns. So we polished the the uh, the, um, the substrate. Uh, we aged it. So th th there was a lot of uh, different uh, um, steps to get. Uh, we didn't use the sample it's as a bulk material, but it has been uh, uh, processed chemically, uh, mechanically, and by using a laser micromachining technique. But the, the material itself is uh, strontium tantalite. <laughs> right. So two different examples of uh, phase change material um, is um, metal oxides or um, um, chalcogenide glasses, such as uh, germanium and timony telluride which are able to switch between uh, different, uh, different, uh, um, different states uh, with different electrical and optical uh, properties when we apply a, uh, an external stimulate such as heat, light, or electrical current. And if we consider, for example, this very simple um, structure which is based on silicon substrate GST layer and a simple cat wire resonator. So this device is equivalent to a simple um, uh, inductance capacitance uh, circuit in series. And actually the, uh, the frequency of resonance is approximately given by this uh, expression. And the black curve here is the spectral response of the structure. Um, and also, uh, we need to mention that GST um, has two main uh, states with uh, um, very uh, different um, dielectric functions. So this structure supports a, a standard dipole-like uh, like resonance. And I previously mentioned that the spectral features of metamaterials uh, strongly depend on, on different factors, including the dielectric uh, environment of, of the structure. So now this is uh, the black curve without GST. So when we uh, add a GST layer between the substrate and the, the cat wire resonator, so we increase the capacitance, the equivalent capacitance of the structure. And according to this equation, when the capacitance is increased, so we can expect to have a, uh, the frequency of resonance, which is shifted to low frequencies. <laughs> and this is the, the, we can observe a minor shift in frequency. And similar effect happens when we start increasing the, uh, the heating temperature. So here we have a um, tunability rate of about 16%. And hopefully, we uh, can demonstrate this effect uh, experimentally. And probably the main drawback of this, uh, of this process is the heating uh, process itself, which might be very slow and uh, may take some time. So this is an example of a structure that integrates photoconductive silicon pads. So actually, when the structure is illuminated, um, the silicon pads induce um, 
charge carriers and become conductive. So the equivalent circuit of the structure will be changed. And we, we have actually a um, switch or um, a uh, shift from two different modes, a low frequency mode to a high frequency mode. So we have used similar uh, concept to demonstrate here a, uh, a, an active control or switching effect in a metamaterial that exhibits some kind of uh, interference effect or uh, analogous of electromagnetically induced transparency, which is actually a quantum phenomenon that happens in three-level atomic system. And um, so the structure can be regarded as the combination of two uh, bright modes. So the, the, the unit cell can be uh, divided to a cut wire resonator and a double split ring resonator. So the cut wire resonator exhibits a broad dipole mode and the double split ring resonator here support a high Q factor resonance. So when these two uh, modes couple to each other, uh, we have here a transparency peak instead of these two transmission dips. And actually this feature is very interesting and could be uh, used uh, to design slow light devices, uh, optical delay lines, something like that. And maybe professor can, be, can recogni recognize one of his uh, slides. <laughs> So I, uh, in the last part of my presentation, I'm uh, going to uh, speak or to show some examples of hybrid modulators based on 2D uh, materials, um, such as graphene and transition uh, metal dichalcogenide. And le let's start with graphene, which has been, uh, has become very popular and uh, brought a lot of uh, properties. And uh, probably uh, what makes um, graphene uh, interesting is uh, its linear dispersion. And there is no bend gap, which means that the particles are able to jump freely from the ground state um, to a, um, and delocalized into a higher uh, state with nothing to stop them. There is no uh, uh, energy barriers. And also probably what makes uh, one of the most interesting features for our needs is probably its electrical conductivity, um, which is tunable by chemical doping, uh, bias voltage, or uh, by a magnetic field. So the physical thickness of the graphene is very small, which makes things very uh, critical and very uh, challenging for, uh, from the simulation point of view. But graphene is also described by uh, its surface conductivity. And usually people um, in simulations uh, treat the graphene as an infinitely thin layer described by its surface impedance. So graphene is usually employed as an active material, which is uh, um, combined or coupled to metamaterial to demonstrate tunable effect. But in this work, um, and I think it's probably uh, one of the pioneering work in this field, uh, people here use the, the, the graphene itself as uh, a tunable metamaterial. So uh, people here look to plasma resonance uh, of uh, um, graphene ribbons. And according to this paper, um, when you apl apply an external voltage, so you will change the concentration of the charge carriers and you will induce a shift of the plasma resonance because the, the frequency of the plasma resonance depends on the concentration. And you can actually get similar effect when you um, change the width of, of the ribbon. I would like to show you here an example that we, uh, a simulation work 
that we um, are currently working on, 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 on it. So this structure is based on symmetric uh, cross shape resonator, which exhibits a, a standard dipole resonance, the, the black curve here. So this is the, uh, the, the transmission coefficient of the structure, which depends on the frequency between uh, 0.5 and 2.1 terahertz. So we have two different kind of, uh, pol uh, of transmission, co-polarized transmission and cross-polarized transmission. So when we start to break the symmetry of the structure, so um, we can observe the emergence of a broad cross-polarized transmission. So we can see here this cross-polarized. In the beginning, we don't have any cross-polarized -polar transmission when the structure was totally symmetric. When we start breaking, we can see the emergence of this broad cross-polarized transmission. And this feature is, is uh, very interesting to build um, tunable and very efficient polarizers, for example. So in this case, we took the, the, the previous structure and we just um, add the graphene here is added on the top surface of, of the device. Uh, we have um, implemented the complex um, surface impedance of the graphene in the numerical model. And by increasing the chemical potential, uh, we can have uh, this very beautiful switching and modulation effect of the spectral features. So this is just a simulation work, and if somebody has any experience or any uh, uh, in the fabrication or in tri uh, graphene transfer, please let us discuss just after the talk because I'm very uh, interested in collaboration. So one of uh, maybe uh, another group of material is transition metal dichalcogenides. <coughs> So um, this kind of, of material has been um, used in different areas, including field effect transistors, integrated circuit, and, and so on. And people here have looked to um, the possibility to integrate molybdenum disulfide with Fano resonance metamaterials to demonstrate a very fast tunable and uh, uh, switching effect at picosecond time scale. So this is a similar work that uh, where people used also molybdenum disulfide, which is coupled to uh, standard split ring resonators, to demonstrate a switching effect with a modulation depth of about 16 percent. Uh, the, spe the spectral response. No, no, I know that. Uh, What's typically going on here? Um, so maybe the, the conductivity of, of the layer. Just, how are you getting picosecond? What are you, this is like a pump probe? Yes, right. This, this is a pump probe, yeah, and you change actually the, uh, the conductance of, of the layer. It's like that. Yes, right. right. And then yes, right, up. exactly. And to... Um, Maybe to conclude, I just would like to come back to this slide and put accent on, on this uh, perspective, um, which is very challenging task uh, to build some kind of uh, platforms <coughs> based on metamaterials with multiple functions and also the ability to switch between different, these different functions. And I also would like to, to thank our group members and collaborators who contributed to this work. Um, Professor Thomas Searles, our group leader. Uh, Siak McConan, a PhD student uh, from Howard University. Um, Josh, Joshua Guro, also a PhD student from University of Dayton. And I also would like to thank our sponsors and our different uh, funding source. And thank you very much for your attention.
um, the, the dimensions of this structure, you mean, or? Yeah, if I looked at the sample that's mounted the right way, what would I see? Uh, I didn't understand. Well, you're coming in optically, right, in, in the jurisdiction of such shape that you need to be on or out of position. Suppose one of us has a sample we want to look at the pairs responsible. What, are, what do we need to do to be ready to put it in? Uh, yeah, maybe we need to have a, a, a substrate, silicon or G, uh, some arson, uh, gallium arsenide or whatever the substrate might be. And we need to print uh, these different uh, um, 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 motif, uh, these different uh, uh, these different samples. It may be just a cross, or okay. but we need first to do simulations okay. and to um, 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 to have first an idea of the spectral response. Okay. Uh, so we cannot just uh, fabricate. So we th the spectral response is uh, really depends on on the dimensions on the. the the geometry yeah. key on the polarization, okay. but we need. What dimensions are being eliminated? Uh, the spot size, uh, maybe yeah. uh, one millimeter, or okay. uh, the the, uh, the waist of, of the beam, terahertz beam. Yes, right. Um, yes, in part, it depends on the structure. Um, uh, here, for example. Yes, right. This, yes, usually people um, they couple the two um, the two concepts. Uh, you can have metamaterial material coupled with uh, with uh, gra um, graphene or uh, silicon or uh, whatever the the active material might be, but uh, actually right now people um, um, are used to reduce maybe the size, the thickness of, of the structure along the the direction of the propagation. They use um, uh, the graphene itself as uh, as a, as a meta surface, and actually this paper this is what uh, these people. Did they d uh, here, for example? So you have the silicon substrate, you have an adhesive layer, you have the graphene and the metal, but here you just have uh, the substrate with the graphene. In terms of computing your time, you mean? Simulation. Yeah, you may. Yes, right, but in simulation, when you have. S um, um, uh, symmetric structure, you can just simulate uh, um, uh, one part of the structure, put boundary conditions, and to reduce the time. Uh. But it's really depend on, on, on what you need to do, uh, the, maybe the topology of the structure. Sometimes you cannot have this kind or this kind of structure uh, by using only the graphene, so you have uh, uh, maybe you need to combine the. Uh, it depends on uh, on the um, on what you need to do. <laughs> uh, my question is why people would have this choice with uh, graphene and trans transfer of the photon. Like what? Why? What? 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 It should have been twice. I mean, why? What is the the reason? Sorry, could you say it again? I'm saying that you said that you are interested in doing this graphene transfer and make the, the structure. Yes, My right. question is why people haven't done that yet? What, 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 what is the thing that's the No, no, obstacle? people, a lot of people do uh, this, but uh, oh. a lot of people do the transfer uh, on, yeah. Even on this? Ye yes, even on this. Uh, that yes, right. What do you use for we have a um, um, femtosecond laser. So we have, uh, and also we have um, 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 photo detector, uh, photo detect, a photo conductor, a meter, and a receptor. Yes, right. And that's how do you make this tunable? Uh, you mean the structure or? Yeah,
Y yes, right. No, no, it's not tunable. I mean, it's not tunable. But no, this the the the, the tunability is on the res the response. Uh, yeah. Exactly right. Exactly. It's up to six uh, terahertz, I think. Um, it's also a photoconductive uh, the antennas, but you have our same time. You have a. Uh, uh, um, you have a broad spectral response uh, at once, I mean. And this. Uh, so Is it like a Fourier transform? Yes, right. Yeah. So there's some kind of interferometer that. Um, so we, we have. A, a fa so I'm not very. Um, from the, the experimental uh, point of view, but we have a femtosecond laser. We have two anemeter detector. Uh, and uh, so we just have um, uh, at uh, one single shot we can uh, um, so we have a uh, uh, at one single shot we have all the spectral response. So what is the resolution rate of the? Uh, I think it's. Uh, To be honest, I didn't remember. It should be around one kilohertz or something like that. Okay, are there more questions? If not, thank you. Thank you very much.